Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash for This Week in Prophecy, Thursday, December 20th, 2018. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you so much for joining us this holiday season. Of course, Hanukkah is over, and now we move to the Nativity and on to the Civil New Year. Whether you celebrate it or not, we give freedom in Christ based on Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 19, and Romans 14, 4 and 5. However, we do take careful stock of the fact that the Nativity is a real historical event, irrespective of what year or what time of year it happened. And we also believe, theologically and doctrinally, that the first coming of Jesus teaches us a tremendous amount about his second coming. Thus, for us, the focus of the Nativity is theological, prophetic, and eschatological, but it's also a time for charity and for using that season evangelistically. There are unsaved people who will never come to church normally, but they might come to a carol service, or they might come out their front door and listen to carolers from a church singing Christmas carols and take a gospel tract. If it can be used to present the gospel of Jesus, I have no problem with it my own opinion, that's about the only thing it's good for. But that's my opinion. Uh, again, one man esteems one day, one another, let each be convinced in his own mind. Who are you to judge the servant of another? Before his own master, he stands or falls. One man esteems one day, one esteems another, let each be convinced in his own mind. Let no one be your judge, Paul writes, concerning a festival, a new moon or a Sabbath, these things are a mere shadow of what is to come. The substance belongs to Christ, and it's to him we look, the author and finisher of our faith. He came once, and he will just as surely come again. But let's move on to this week's events in prophecy. Within the last several hours, an announcement has been made on Twitter by President Trump and from unidentified sources in the White House that President Trump has decided to withdraw the remaining American troops from Northeast Syria. We've been fighting for a long time in Syria. I've been president for almost two years, and we've really stepped it up. And we have won against ISIS. We've beaten them, and we've beaten them badly. We've taken back the land. And now it's time for our troops to come back home. If this is true, and it seems to be true, the question is, how was this decision arrived at, and what are the potential ramifications? It would be difficult, very difficult, for this kind of a situation to be determined by the president as a decision to remove the troops without things happening in the diplomatic sphere, in communications with Israel, in communications with possibly Russia. But it does place Israel in what would appear to be a precarious position. Although American relations with Israel nationally stand strong, there have always been rogue elements within intelligence communities, both American and Israeli, as well as British and others. Much of this has had to do with arms trading. Most notoriously, we saw the Wilson affair when George um, Bush Sr. had been president later, but when he was director of the CIA, the Wilson affair actually saw American special forces training terrorists in Gaddafi's Libya as a rogue operation, and it got quite advanced before it was discovered, leading to allegations, conspiracy theorists of Bush's personal involvement. Well, Wilson himself was sent to prison for more than 25 years, and he spent most of it locked up in prison. Um, he definitely was a rogue element. We've had other rogue elements allegedly before in Israel. There was rogue elements involved in the Pollard affair. Pollard spent similarly 25, 30 years in an American prison, and it badly damaged Israeli-American relations. Well, although the United States was not the victim of the latest breach of decorum by an intelligence community, specifically Israel, uh, 
the United States has imposed sanctions on a reserve Israeli major general, uh, Israel Zeev, for arms sales to both sides in the Sudan conflict, selling arms to southern Sudan, which is predominantly Christian, and northern Sudan, which is predominantly Muslim, essentially selling weapons to both sides. This irked the Trump administration, and although it was not something they assigned any responsibility for to Israel or the Mossad, it is almost for certain that rogue elements within the Israeli intelligence community knew what he was doing. These kinds of arms deals take place all the time, and many countries are involved in illegal arms deals. Many countries. That includes the United States. It has included, in times past, South Africa. It has included France, Great Britain, and certainly Israel. None of them are immune, but these things have happened and still can. This may not, however, be a factor in the decision of the Trump administration and of President Trump personally to remove the 2,000 or so American troops in Syria. The immediate ramifications would appear to be, in the thinking of most people, was that Israel must now stand alone on the Golan Heights in the face of a potential threat from Iran and Iranian-backed forces. However, it is more complicated than that. First of all, Mr. Trump has stated on more than one occasion that the reason and the only reason for the American military presence in Syria was the elimination of ISIS. And now that ISIS is removed, there is no mandate for American continued presence. Mr. Trump wanted to remove American troops as far back as March of 2018, but he was persuaded not to do so by the Secretary of State and by the Secretary of Defense for fear of an ISIS resurgence and also that it would play into the hands of Iranian and Russian-backed Iranian interests inside of Syria. It would create basically a strategic monolith now where you would have a reconsolidated Syria in league with Iran and strong Russian backing and nothing or no one there to stop them. At the same time, Iran and Hezbollah have withdrawn further back from the Golan Heights. Hezbollah, backed by Iran, has relocated its main operational headquarters, as we've reported in the past, this week in Prophecy, in conjunction with Nasrallah in northern Lebanon, to Lebanon, to the Lebanon region. Uh, this could have different implications, meaning that the Iranian shift will be more from a direct northern threat to the Israeli border from Lebanon as opposed to the Golan Heights, which is well fortified and strategically difficult to attack and certainly to invade Israel from that direction. Nonetheless, the question emerges, what is going to stop Russia and Iran from filling in the gap? Whether or not National Security Advisor John Bolton, Secretary of State Mike uh, Pompeo, and the Secretary of Defense James Mattis are going to attempt again to persuade President Trump to delay the decision has not been finalized. We don't know 100% for sure as of this very moment whether it is going to happen, although it would seem likely at this point. It is also possible that the United States will do something else. For fear of repeating the disastrous policies of the Obama administration, when they withdrew from northern Iraq, creating a gateway for ISIS to take power and for Iran to move in to Iraq, by removing the American advisors who were left there, the American military and intelligence community could conceivably use civilian paramilitary forces as ongoing advisors to the indigenous Kurdish militias. That is a possibility. In other words, Russia has been using mercenaries. The United States 
could use civilian paramilitary forces instead of ordinary uniformed forces. This is a foreign policy that has much precedent for a number of countries, including the United States. It is also a possibility. It is, however, for sure that there must be some coordination with Mr. Netanyahu and his government before this final move will be taken. Whether or not there have been discussions with Russia is unknown. However, we do know that Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, has said that Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, is himself not really running American diplomatic policy concerning Russia. He is only a secondary voice in foreign policy specifically concerning Russia. That brief is largely in the hands of John Bolton, co-equally capable as Mr. Pompeo. Something definitely is going on, and more is going on than we are being told. This is for absolutely certain. But let's move on. This week in Prophecy, Benjamin Netanyahu announced that indigenously manufactured Israeli surface-to-surface -surface missiles are well capable of hitting any target anywhere in the Middle East and even beyond, and have guided systems that will be assisted by microsatellites. This is an advanced level of technological warfare that rivals Russia. It's only eclipsed easily by the United States, and even there, not completely easily. It certainly rivals the capacity of Russia operating in that region, and it surpasses any capacity thus far of Iran or any Arab states attempting to gain such technological competence in terms of guided missiles and guidance systems for guidance missiles. Jericho 2 missiles and American surface-to-air missiles have been deployed in Israel for some time. What we're seeing now, however, is a missile system that although probably developed with the help of American technology or an indigenous Israeli technology, not dependent on the United States for manufacture. But so it continues this week in prophecy. Why does Mr. Netanyahu highlight it this week in prophecy? Again, when you see such things being stated, there is a political reason, a diplomatic reason, a strategic reason. That reason is usually warning usually warning to potential opposition that we have you covered and there will be ramifications if you engage in offensive action against Israel. But let's move forward. This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the government of Theresa May continues to fail to build a consensus for a negotiated settlement for leaving the European Union. Again, she has been a miserably failed prime minister from day one, nearly losing an election to Jeremy Corbyn, as we pointed out, rescued only by Northern Irish Unionists. She is a pro-Remain prime minister after the nation democratically voted for Brexit. She is a member, and many would describe her as a puppet, of the Europhile British establishment who were pro-Remain and not pro-Brexit. And as we've said multiple times, given the Brexit vote democratically, it was an insult to the British voter that she was ever put into number 10. Her leadership has done nothing but fail and fail colossally on domestic as well as foreign policy. She is warning now in an act of political desperation that a Hard Brexit, that is just Britain leaving in March of the forthcoming year, could result in infrastructural malfunctions culminating in food shortages, 
med medicine shortages and in shortages of other vital commodities and transport. But she's also warning of the danger of a run on banks and of a financial crisis if there is a unnegotiated withdrawal from Europe. 3,500 British military troops have been put on alert for anti-riot duty. Now, this, of course, may be, and is at least in part, political posturing, political posturing and political scaremongering by a desperate prime minister who does not have the consolidated support of many members and backbenchers of her own party in parliament who realize the sham of what she wants to hand to Europe. Essentially, Britain would remain almost in Europe in most respects, uh, in everything but name. It is a bad bill of goods. Meanwhile, the Europhiles continue to demand another referendum, telling the people that if they do not negate the first referendum, they're not behaving in a democratic manner. Some polls have claimed that up to 53% of British people want a second referendum. However, at least 90% of people state that they will vote the way they did the first time if there is another referendum. It was rather close. It was a close decision by referendum. They would only need a few points to keep Britain in the European Union, and to basically undermine what the British people democratically voted for in the first referendum. Again, these are people with no integrity. These are people with no commitment to democratic principles. These are people who are simply political hacks acting on behalf of select interests, not doing what the people of Great Britain voted for. This is indeed most unfortunate. It is my personal hope, I would say aspiration, prayer, that Britain would not accept the terms of leaving Europe ineptly negotiated by Theresa May. It is my hope that she is removed from number 10 as party leader and as prime minister, and that a conservative and a pro-British as opposed to pro-European prime minister takes her place. This would be the best thing that could happen. The role that the Northern Irish Unionists would play is another crucial factor. It is a very complicated situation because of the border between Northern and Southern Ireland, which would become a border between Europe and the non-EU Great Britain if there's not a separate negotiation. I would prefer a separate negotiation between the Republic of Ireland and the British government concerning border and cross-border trade between Northern and Southern Ireland. Um, it doesn't have to be as complicated as is being postulated by the anti-Brexit voices in Parliament and in the European Union. However, the socialist-dominated European Union, again, in no sense a democratic body, would undoubtedly try to bully and pressure the Republic of Ireland into doing whatever Brussels wanted, and it is most likely the Republic of Ireland would do that, unless it was economically forced to do otherwise. If there is a hard Brexit, the Republic of Ireland may in pure financial terms be compelled to reconsider its own relationship with Europe. Again, these things go back once more to the book of Daniel chapter two in desperation, attempting to make the iron adhere to the clay. Let us take note of the fact that the Republic of Ireland, what is today called Ireland, in the ancient world called Hibernia, Hibernia, was never part of the Roman Empire. The Romans didn't even want it. Continental interest in Ireland was always strategic against Great Britain. Spain wanted a Catholic Ireland. The papacy wanted a Catholic Ireland to dethrone 
a Protestant Great Britain. That is the interest of Europe. It has always been something anti-British. It has never been something pro-Irish. Ireland has never gotten a good deal historically either from the British or from the continent, from Europe. It's never gotten a good deal from anyone with the possible exception of the United States on the other side of the Atlantic. These things are highly problematic and complicated for Ireland, not just Great Britain. The ramifications of whatever happens with Brexit will affect not only England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. They will encompass Republic of Ireland because of the economic and political ramifications, as well as inspiring more autonomy from Brussels, certainly in Eastern Europe, countries such as Poland and Hungary, but possibly even at least to a degree in Denmark, in the Czech Republic, which has its own currency, not the euro, and Denmark, which has the kroner, not the euro. As with anything else, follow the money, the pound, the kroner. Who does not have the euro? Let's move on this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, a major editorial in the Wall Street Journal has sparked something of a diplomatic furor. For the first time, although some say it was predictable, it was revealed that there has been a close secret cooperation between the United States, Israeli intelligence, and the Department of Intelligence of Saudi Arabia. Now, everyone knew it. Everybody in the diplomatic world knew it. Everyone knew it. But it was never officially announced and still has not been officially announced, but it's certainly officially disclosed. There is a battle politically in Saudi Arabia. Prince Mohammed bin Salman, working in conjunction with the United States and Israel, has made a move on the old Wahhabist elite. However, the Khashoggi killing in Turkey has had legal and political and diplomatic ramifications globally. Again, Khashoggi was not a good person. He was a bad person, a friend of the Muslim Brotherhood, not a friend of the United States. Unfortunately, he was given a visa to enter the United States. The Obama administration, I think, would have given a visa to enter the United States to anybody. They gave them to the San Bernardino terrorists. Nonetheless, following the Khashoggi affair, a political shakeup has happened. As a result of this, General Ahmad al-Asiri, who is the commander of, or the chief of, the Saudi Department of Intelligence, and also Saeed al Qatani, a political advisor to Prince bin Salman, Mohammed bin Salman, have both been forced into resignation following the Khashoggi assassination in Istanbul. As a result of this, there has been something of an internal challenge to the rule of Mohammed bin Salman, who is more favorably disposed towards Israel and more progressive in his philosophy economically and politically concerning Saudi Arabia's future. This has caused something of a conservative backlash. The king of Saudi Arabia, King Salman, is more traditional in his anti-Israel sympathies. He is more in bed with the Wahhabist or the Salafist clergy and he's less hostile to the corrupt financial interests who are brought to task by his son, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. It is generally agreed that the crown prince will remain in power, but his level of power seems to be temporarily diminished. Whether it will be permanent or not remains to be seen. One consequence of this, however, undoubtedly will be 
the scraping of the proposed Trump peace plan for the Middle East. Now, this may be a good thing. Any pressure brought by the United States on Israel to give land for peace to any Islamic nation is doomed to turn against Israel in the future. We know this from the pages of prophecy. There will be a false peace in the Middle East that will be engineered by the Antichrist. We know that the outer court of the Temple Mount will be given to the Gentiles while a tribulational temple is standing. We know these things. They have to happen. The question is when they will happen and what role the foreign policy of the Trump administration will play in preparing the way for it. Similarly, those who believe there is a twofold fulfillment of Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39, not simply a Gog and Magog battle, which is obvious at the end of the book of Revelation, and which must be the main one, because it is the one the New Testament speaks of directly, the, at, the end of the, at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, after the thousand year reign, there will be a Gog and Magog battle, and that has to be the primary one Ezekiel is speaking of. But many people, many people, believe there's adequate reason to believe there will be a previous Gog and Magog scenario that will prefigure, foreshadow the final one at the end of the millennial reign. And they have good reason to believe that. Now, I am not dogmatic about it, but it does seem to me that there could be two battles of Gog and Magog, although I cannot be absolutely as dogmatic as some people. When we read about Ezekiel's dry bones, you can say that that appears to be the rebirth of national Israel, but it is also a picture of the resurrection, flesh coming onto bones. And then a Gog and Magog scenario following the final resurrection and so forth. It could be a Pesher interpretation, a Peshet and a Pesher, a double fulfillment, as it were. Will the policies of the Trump administration in removing American forces from Syria open the door for a Russian-led or Russian-sponsored Iranian-Syrian invasion of Galilee? that will end in a military disaster for Russia and for the invading countries? That is a very good question. However, in the constellation of nations that we see in Gog and Magog, there are no Arabs. There are no Arab nations, a feature frequently overlooked. The only partial exception would be Put, which is Libya, not Syria. Nonetheless, let us continue looking at the ramifications of the power shaking going on in Saudi Arabia. The Wahhabist radicals and the ultra-fundamentalist clergy, the Salafis, are very much under threat in their political position and their social position of privilege. They do not like anything progressive being carried out by Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The prince who's a younger person has a more realistic perspective. He understands the demographic time bomb of the younger and younger average age of the average Saudi Arabian. The potential problems of unemployment and social disorder that will come from it. Knowing that oil is not <clears throat> a goose that lays golden eggs perpetually. Already we have seen declines in the power of OPEC. A situation where even though the Iranian oil output and marketing of Iranian oil on the international market is affected by the Trump administration's sanctions. And even though Venezuela's oil industry 
is almost on the skids. It has not caused oil prices to remain high. In fact, oil prices have plummeted once again below $50 a barrel as we speak. Now, this is happening at a time of year where there is a high demand for oil in the developed world because of the cold. But there's more to it than this. The reality is fracking. The United States is on the precipice of becoming the world's largest oil producer and has very recently become an exporter. Not a major one yet, but certainly an exporter. What we are also seeing, of course, is the boom in natural gas and we have not even begun to see even the infancy of what would happen if the tropic fisher method of converting bituminous anthracite coal into petroleum was to be perfected to a more modern process where oil can be produced cheaply from coal. At the present time, it costs a out $40 a barrel to turn coal into gasoline, one slight molecule difference in the structural formula of the petroleum. Uh, if that price comes down even further, and you will see gasoline being made from coal, Hitler fueled his army with petroleum or gasoline synthetically made from coal. The Republic of South Africa calls it Sassol, and it's in wide commercial usage. But there is considerable research and development into this method that has been around since the 1930s. And progress is being made. That, however, is a long-term prospect. In the shorter-term prospect, electric cars certainly the boom of natural gas in the United States and fracking have made an insurmountable difference. Things cannot be the same. Bearing in mind also that the United States is the Saudi Arabia of coal, as are other English-speaking countries, even Great Britain, but certainly Australia and Canada have huge coal reserves. That is a long-term prospect, but even in the short term, with the boom in natural gas and in fracking, despite what's happening in Venezuela, despite what's happening with Iran, despite less oil going on the market, oil prices are going down. This waxes favorably for the United States in its trade competition with China. But also, it is economically disadvantageous to Saudi Arabia and to Russia. It causes financial problems for Mr. Putin and longer term for Saudi Arabia. Prince Ben Salman realizes this. Mohammed Ben Salman realizes this. And as we've said before in this week in prophecy, he understands he has to begin taking cues from Abu Dhabi and from Dubai in finding non-oil-based revenue instead of just thinking that oil can be pumped ad infinitum in order to subsidize what is otherwise a not a very productive economy. But it's happening this week in prophecy. What has been disclosed by the Wall Street Journal is largely what is known, but has emphasized that the cooperation has not only been in intelligence between the Mossad, the Saudis, and the CIA, but in Israeli technology, including population control technology being used to control radical Islamic Wahhabists inside of Saudi Arabia. That technology that is being purchased by the Saudi Arabian government is largely coming from Israel, probably some from the United States and Great Britain as well, but certainly from Israel. This secret cooperation is now somewhat under threat 
because of the resurgent power of King Salmon in the aftermath of the Khashoggi affair. So understand there is a political battle going on in Saudi Arabia that has theological and prophetic ramifications for end time prophecy. It also has ramifications for the Trump peace plan, which relies upon an improvement in Saudi-Israeli relations. Now, again, this may not be a bad thing. It may be a good thing if Israel was to be pressured by the American government to give up land for peace. Efforts to give up land for peace to the so-called Palestinian Arabs have never worked before. Israel forfeited control of Gaza, which it took in self-defense in 1967, and it has not bought peace, it's only bought more terror. Similarly, Israeli withdrawals from southern Lebanon have not really bought more peace, they've just bought about a situation where every several years a new Katusha war takes place. What is happening? What we may be sure of is whatever happens will happen in accordance with the plans and purposes of God. All of these things, again, pointing to the return of Jesus. And so, as we reflect on his first coming during this holiday season, let us indeed prayerfully look ahead to his second, realizing that the Lord has placed us here at this time in history with a great task of which we are neither worthy or capable to be the harbingers of the return of his son. Season's blessings. But I'd like to leave you this week in prophecy with a short film clip from our children's mission in the Philippines. The children have their new clothes for the forthcoming year. We give it to them at this time of year. These are very poor children that we've rescued from rubbish tips, rubbish dumps. And we have a new facility under construction that is probably about between two thirds and three quarters finished. But in the meantime, Let's watch our children thanking the Lord Jesus and thanking you for your prayers and support and for their Christmas gifts, which are new clothes. We're not talking about toys from Santa. We're talking about the essentials of life that these children did not have. But by the grace of God and with your help and prayers, we've been able to give them. My name is James Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for listening. God bless.